Morning all. Let's have a look at a very famous David Bronstein game where there was a huge amount of dynamism and risk on White's part, to say the least. So I'll call this potentially losing trump cards out of the opening, straight out of the opening. Um, as you recently may have observed, I've been playing around with the Anakine defense in, in five minute chess uh, recently. And, um, you know, it's got a provocation strategy to create weaknesses in, in uh, the white position, committing white pawns forward. Here, David actually, he goes all in on the white side uh, with the four pawns attack variation. So none of the safer solid continuations. He plays c4 here against Lubo, who was considered an expert himself in, in the Anakine defense. And three years earlier to this game, and actually been playing on the white side of this variation, curiously. And this had sort of led to him innovating in this game later, with the move g6, as we're going to see later. Um, here, so David goes all in with f4. I'm not sure how popular this, this line is nowadays, because as I say, it's a real commitment for pawn weaknesses. So this is a way of getting potentially losing trump cards. And you may wonder what what is white's trump card? Black's trump card is clear. He's got a, a really big center to undermine here and create loads of weaknesses and exploit this vacuum. So isn't this like really, really um, crazy for white to do this? Well, black took on e5 and after f takes e, we see that if white can get the pieces out of the box, then, you know, potentially this e5 pawn um, could be used as a kind of spearhead for a black king position over here. But this really all depends if white can survive uh, with such weaknesses in his position and get his pieces out later. Black's play is very energetic now to try and crumble the white center. And it's a kind of king's engine side attacking move now, c5. Obviously, white doesn't want to take on c5 because then queen takes and as well as the king being the center, black's going to easily regain one of these pawns. So that would be terrible. So white is again forced to push the pawn like to d5, and it's slightly weak now. And here uh, the move e6 was played. There are other alternatives. Maybe g6 could be considered. Uh, so white supports the d5 pawn, because remember, it's under great pressure now from queen and knight and pawn. So it's supported with knight c3. The point is now, after e, d, c takes d, black now plays this move c4, which not only liberates the bishop, it means that bishop b4 has a concrete idea of pinning the knight and putting more pressure on d5. So to say this is a risky line for white is kind of an understatement. Not only that, if white wants to castle king's side, the king's going to be on g1, but the bishop can come to c5 to stop castling king's side as well if needed. White's next move is to develop the knight to f3. Okay, he's getting some pieces developed. He's supporting e5. But there's a wealth of options at black's disposal. Black chooses, actually, to play bishop g4. Okay. So bishop g4. And this next move is interesting. It is it is a centralizing move. It does cut out black's possibility of bishop c5. Uh, if black wanted to play bishop c5 to stop white casting, it's stopped by this next move, queen d4. Now, black takes on f3, voluntarily giving up the light squared bishop, but shattering a bit white's pawns on the king side. Okay, white has the two bishops, but look at black's uh, bishop and these dark squares are really kind of weak in white's king position. And also there's potential for queen h4 if the queen wasn't guarding h4. Okay, but the immediate thing is this d5 vulnerability. So bishop b4, and in order to support d5, um, you know, if d6, then this, this might actually pr pr provoke knight c6. And this is starting to get quite unpleasant. Uh, so here, actually, Bishop takes c4 was played. Maybe, in fact, looking theoretically, d6 actually might be one of the viable options here in this position on move 12. So move 12, bishop b4, 
Okay, bishop takes c4, according to chess games com, has been played nine times before. But this is a really hair-raising continuation, obviously. Um, so bishop takes c4. The problem with bishop c4, it's not really shielding the white knight on the c file or the bishop on the c file. If a black rook can get to c8 later, there's going to be pressure here, as well as this diagonal still being sensitive. White really wants to try and castle somewhere. Okay. Black now castles, and is the king a target here with uh, this G file? Funny enough, in recent times, there's been a move which was played in a simul, which maybe it makes it more uh, kind of a discounted move here. But actually, I'm checking with um, Houdini, actually, uh, this engine Houdini. The, in a simul in uh, 1994, David Roberts was playing a, a, a grandmaster, Baburin, funny enough, as white, which is quite rare for simuls. And he played the move bishop h6. And actually, I think Houdini is actually liking bishop h6. I'll show you a crazy idea. So it's to play e6 now and, and threaten um, rook g1 mating. So bishop h6 is immediately, um, you know, creating direct threats on g7. So say takes e6, and white could actually stand better. Here's an example. Check blocking. We have this crazy variation. Where white would stand better here. According to Houdini, white's actually slightly better. So if you want to go through this crazy variation as white, there might actually be a way to more soundly do it than, than David did back in um, in this game in in 1973 so actually an interesting move to consider is bishop h6 but this move is i don't know if it was planned or it was a blunder a few people thought he's going to lose a rook for nothing and it's going to be a quick knockout for white this next move has some logic to it but it has some very uh, clear tactical downside of course rook g1 puts pressure on the black king. Of course there's a threat of e6 and queen g7. That's clear enough. But black now uh, plays g6. And this is Lubo's innovation. Because three years earlier, he was playing the white side. And he smashed someone up. I'll, I'll get the detail, actually. Uh, he was playing against... Um, Honfi in a, a small Yugoslav town of Kasak. Okay, and in that game, there was Queen C7, and this allowed E6. So that G7 is a problem. F6, and now Bishop H6, offering the Bishop on C4. And there was a beautiful winning sequence here. Rook takes G7. And here, there's an incredibly beautiful idea to do with this magical queen in the centre. You know how I often say pieces in the centre have great versatility? This is really demonstrated by this game, which Lubo played, actually, three years earlier. Then in this position, can you see a forced win for white? If I give you ten seconds, starting from now. Okay, I'll give you the first move and, and let you try and find the next move. Rook g8 check is the first move. Now it's clear that rook takes g8, queen f6 is mating. But what's sneaky is after king takes g1, can you see the winning move here which Lubo played? If I give you 10 seconds here. Okay, it seems coincidental, but queen g1 coincidental that this pawn is actually stopping the king escaping and this queen retreat is actually so decisive so next move will be mate so that was a beautiful game Lubo had played three years earlier to this game hence his innovation to safeguard his king he had chosen g6 here in this position uh, so after rook g1 g6 thinking yeah he's still got uh, this idea now queen c7 is an ominous threat really in this position uh, because as well as attacking c4 forcing the bishop to move somewhere it gives that slicing diagonal for the bishop now i don't know what to label this move for, for practical human play 
it's it's still risky. It, this hasn't been a beaten path since this game. And when people have tried to simulate it against Lugo, probably cheekily, uh, he's been beating them now. He's had two wins actually in in this line, uh, where people maybe nostalgically have tried to recreate the David Bronstein uh, win with Bishop G5. There are actually four games at Chess Gamescom and it's following this amazing sequence. Um, so Bishop G5 is basically encouraging the loss of an entire rook. Based on what I've just said with Queen C7, Bishop G5 is now encouraging the loss of an entire rook. Um, <laughs> because Queen C7 and most of us would think this is tactically embarrassing because if the bishop moves bishop c5 skewer queen and rook so this is what happened believe it or not bishop b3 bishop c5 skewering queen and rook what would you do as white would you consider resigning or do you think there's some weaknesses around the black king it's interesting well david's uh I have no idea if this was prepared. Apparently during the game he was very heavily short on time. Hence a lot of moves were played from black in a lost position. Maybe to just try and win on time. Believe it or not. So um, Queen F4. But is that evidence that this was prepared? I'm not sure. I think this line was played in David Bronstein's youth. This four pawns attack line. And he had a great intuition for the position and the possibilities. And obviously there's the sense that black's king is is white's trump card if there's any trump card white has from this opening playing the four pawns attack line is to try and get at the black king forget material if he can get at the black king it will be okay it will justify the whole thing but he is giving up here an entire rook okay so bishop takes g1 and okay you might immediately think uh, here and let, let's turn on an engine for this what would be a same way to carry on uh, the attack here can you play for example bishop f6 to try and get in on the dark squares with the white king in the center actually black can now play queen c5 apparently and so say a move like this would, would fail now actually because queen e3 check actually gets the queen off so you can't do an easy queen invasion like that uh, so bishop f6 is ruled out the move David plays is probably one of the most practical moves d6 okay and here okay you might consider well, in the game queen c8 was played but in queen, the queen c5 line there's another aspect of black's king safety forget bishop f6 um, there's e6 And this is starting to get, uh, you know, complicated. But, um, okay. <laughs> In this position, a rook down, d6 was played, and queen c8 was played, though. Okay, which might be inferior. It might be inferior to this queen c5 move here. The best move after queen c5. Um, might actually be knight e4 and um, we have a complex variation with e6 now threatening nasty things and black offering a knight sack just to try and um, defend like f6 and this is getting hair raising but maybe black can survive this position okay but in the game queen c8 a bit of a passive looking move and now king e2 now with the king on e2 it actually means here that queen c5 is a lot more justified uh, not only defending the bishop from this threat of rook takes g1 but also introducing other possibilities against knight e4 like queen b5 check check so queen c5 i believe is the strongest move now and this next move by by many references was was a clear blunder and a, a move played quickly because there was a kind of blitz rhythmic tempo to the game up up to now and this this unfortunately was within that rhythmic tempo uh, of, of, of playing uh, very quickly and um, 
So bishop c5. And it means now white's given the opportunity to really get his fork into these dark squares. He played knight e4. And after knight uh, 8 to d7, he finds a way actually of deflecting now the black knight away from f6. He plays actually rook c1. And his idea is going to decoy this knight away from f6 so he can get a strong knight to f6 now. So his idea after queen c6, bang, rook takes c5, exchange sack with a purpose just to get a big knight, huge knight to f6. And now an immediate mate threat, queen takes h7. And it's difficult for black to defend this position. But the remarkable thing is, uh, here now, at this point in the game, after queen b5 check, David f somehow plays um, the most accurate move in the position. And it's a kind of counterintuitive move again. Um, I don't know how many of you would play this next move. If you'd like to stop the video uh, or, or think about this position for, for 10 seconds, I'll give you 10 seconds now, but stop. What would you play now as white? So 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. Now our immediate intuition would surely be a way, you know, tuck the king away from, from, from the checks. And say say king f2. But actually, um, this would give black a lot more chances according to my um, engine analysis. The king's actually a little bit more exposed. Say h5, knight takes to try and break through to black king. You see there's tactical implications of the king being on f2, like queen b4 here. Because this knight can be used uh, to sort of play this move now. So queen takes and, and, and that will be the end of white's attack. But white can still play this position with check. So black can still play this position. Um, and if queen h6, check check. This is all very, very razor sharp stuff. I'm, I'm checking with an engine. Now knight e6. And it's all getting a bit crazy. But white could still end up better in this line by a fraction um, with totally precise play. But the way David uh, Bronstein played it was much, much, much stronger here. He played like I consider a double exclamation mark move. He played actually king e3, believe it or not, and it forces black to run out of checks. Um, the, qu the queen d3 check, for example, is, is harmless now. King f2, and you know the bishop's covering uh, d2, and the, you know the knight, if the knight can't get into d3, there's no way of exchanging off um, the queen or threatening the queen. So h5, there's knight takes h5, and that's really crushing here. So this was a brilliant move after all this storm, giving up the rook, the exchange sack. To play this move king e3 is either bravery or complete genius. Here it's complete genius and it's validated by, by modern engines. This just moving the king forward now. So black's in real trouble. Um, he plays the, like h5 to fend off. And he can he plays what he considers is the only defence now. He countersacks his queen with queen takes b3 check. Sorry, queen takes b3 check here. Uh, what can black do? You can see that the fortress has been invaded now. On uh, just just a mate in free. If if black had taken taken that. So uh, he sacks his queen, Lubo sacks his queen, queen takes b3. But it's hopeless. The thing is here, knight d5, another very, very strong move with the king. Now I wonder if you can guess it if I give you 10 seconds. I know I'm getting you guessing king moves in the middle of a middle game, right? But this is amazing stuff. King f2 will do here, actually. So let's, let's go on. King d4 was played. So the king's like munching material now, forking these two. Uh, knights. <laughs> okay, so check 
and the king marches on munching material and it's really all over here now after this storm white's just clearly better the rooks are helpless against queen and knight here so queen takes g5 but david apparently was in huge time uh, pressure and so we we see a little bit of a game continuation here so d7 and that pawn's very dangerous now knight g4 so it could come into h6 or queen a e5 it's all over really but this rook a6 looks a bit dangerous because the rook a5 not really queen takes because the, the d pawn's queening after f takes check queen takes f4 and finally black resigns we've re we've reached move 40 so i guess that means extra time so black decides to resign move 41 f4 so it's it's i don't recommend this opening at all please do not play it please do not lose opening uh, games of it it's it's a way of getting really potentially losing trump cards someone did cynically question and correctly so that when you play to try and create imbalances um, you know you do incur risk and this is the most dramatic uh, risk taking from a Bronstein game well akin to that um, <laughs> whole bishop sack we saw in the first Bronstein game a few days ago this is a bit like that but an entire rook sacrifice but stemming, stemming from an opening which is incredibly risky anyway it's my whole point of playing the other kind defense recently is to create this provocation and tactical chances what has a lot of tactical vulnerabilities so playing this line with white is playing with fire anyway um, checking on chess games for those that are interested in the popularity of this line um, you know f4 is not the most popular um, actually in this position E takes d6 is the most popular with 844 games. So f4 is the second most popular move though. So it's still played a little bit sometimes. So it takes, takes, d takes, f takes to avoid the exchange of queens obviously. Then we saw c5 which is the second most popular here move. Usually knight c6 is played actually instead of c5. Knight c6. And that's that's interesting and then bishop e3 and we have you know theory here bishop f5 and it continues but in the game we saw that sharp move uh, c5 which statistically has got uh, only 53 games here on, on chess games com but this it actually favors black this idea so that's interesting it's got a 43 percent win rate for black uh, so d5 and now here um, there's e6 or g6 but g6 has only got nine games e6 has got the majority the 40 games so we see this continuation knight c3 ed5 cd5 and indeed c4 has been pl played 35 times so knight f3 and you might consider actually uh, you know, is Bishop G4 um, really the only move? Well, actually, Bishop B4 as well is, has been played before. But Bishop G4 is the top played move, 17 games. And Queen D4. So we're, we're getting close to this bronze theme path now. Uh, and we're into like nine game territory after, you know, G takes F3. Um, so a lot of the games are probably for nostalgic reasons around this David Bronstein game with with the rook sacrifice the funny thing is though that this whole line might actually be quite playable for white based on this move from a simultaneous display played more recently that actually I'm checking with Houdini and it does seem to think um, that in this position um, you know bishop h6 might actually be uh, a, a strong move once once you feed bishop h6 in here it seems to give white an advantage it's a crazy idea in its own right this bishop h6 so if you do want to play this line with white 
Maybe Bishop H6 is handy to know. I'll just make sure I, will, I was using uh, Houdini now. So Bishop H6 in this position, crazy idea. So G takes E6 with big threat, like Rook G1. And if F6 here, there's the move D6, believe it or not. So what's going on here, you might ask. Let's say Bishop takes D6, there's E7 check winning the Queen. And if Queen takes D6, E7 check, just take the Queen and take the Rook. So the move d6 here is, is looking as though white's getting a lot of compensation. So this move might need checking out, this bishop h6, if this line is to be played. This rook g1 really puts white on the brink of losing. And maybe, you know, technically white should have definitely um, lost if he was playing like a modern supercomputer. But he was still playing an expert in, in the Anakine defense. Uh, Lubo, who'd, who played even with the white side, as I say, three years earlier to this game and that's why this innovation g6 was played to shield off you know that brilliant continuation he had three years earlier uh, but it does suffer from dark squares it's just the way these dark squares uh, were punished is kind of uh, extremely in a dynamic fashion with the idea of first giving up the rook an entire rook uh, to play queen f4 so it keeps the queen and bishop in, in the ballpark area um, and then this casual move d6, it opens up on f7, tying down this rook, still keeping these possibilities. Um, so queen c5 is po possibly a slight improvement here over queen c8. And there's been some Lubo games recently in this, where actually Lubo did play uh, queen c5 here. I'll just find this game. Six games in this g6 path with bishop g5 getting into four game territory bishop b3 bishop c5 queen f4 bishop takes g1 so d6 you see Grunfeld had played Lubo in 1979 so Lubo black again so Grunfeld's being cheeky with this rook sacrifice but Lubo had actually played queen c5 here uh, as an improvement to his classic Bronstein game uh, so queen c5 on move 18. So it's like um, it's it's a nostalgic path now. This this game, if queen c5 had been played, there's some interesting new new possibilities uh, for black. In in that game, so knight e4, queen d4, and Lubo was very um, dynamic to try and defend off the crude mating threats, crude but simple uh, mating threats here. Um, in fact, let's, let's paste that game in here over the top of this one, just temporarily, just to show you. So this is what happened in this game. It looks as though Black's King's in real trouble. This move, Knight 8, D7 computer-like move and he just sacrifices his rook to, to st save off you know the king onslaught and he gets the queens off and he survives this game he actually wins this game with black so he's had revenge <laughs> here with in this line so he's since become an expert in this line so that's that's how to, to beat it off so let's undo that that game so let's go back to this nostalgic game then with Queen c8 so the move king e2 and white's king was really remarkable as well um, as, as the exchange sack as well on c5 which seems to, it's a very logical exchange sack to distract the knight away from the f6 square anyway this rook c1 and here it's, it's plain sailing now it starts to be plain sailing if you can see these these king movements as well king towards the center of the action and then, and then it's all over. Black really is uh, getting a lost position now. Okay, uh, so that that's a really fascinating game, I thought. Uh, please leave any comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.